Hello everyone, welcome back to the Tarika Foundation podcast. I am your host Poonam. I have Diane Tillman with me today. Diane Tillman is the primary author for more than 20 living value education books and the co-founder of the Living Value Education. She is a licensed educational psychologist, marriage and family therapist, Values Education Authority, and a meditator. If you remember, we were talking about the Living Value Education, its origin, and we did talk about what are values and the importance of values and who has the responsibility to teach living values to our next generation. So, Diane, welcome back. I'm very excited to have the third episode with you. Uh, before we start our today's conversation, I would like to tell you I had an opportunity to do, to do the homework you were asking our audience to do. Um, you asked us to think about the person who has influenced uh, my life in a positive way. So for me, my grandma picture came in front of me when I was thinking about that person. And what did I admire about her? Um, she was very loving and caring person, and she was always ready to help others. So I felt myself when I was with her. I was, you know, able to open up and share my feelings with her because I knew no matter what, um, she will love me. You know, she will not judge me. Uh, she will not scold me and, you know, a lifting, a lift, uplifting hand on me. That is no way she will do that. So I could, you know, be with her and feel good about myself. So that's what I admired about her. She sounds like a very wonderful woman. What a loving grandmother you had. And it's a pleasure to be with you again, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes. So definitely I miss her and she made a huge impact on my life. Um, and the other exercise you inspired me to rather do with my family, I asked them about the two values. You know, if those two values everybody has in this world, how this world will look like. So they were like telling me peace and respect. Those are the two values which are very important to them. And they do believe if everyone respect and accept each other the way we are, this world will be a better place to live, work, and play. That's lovely that you asked that question. That's a question I usually begin every single workshop with. Because when you ask people what two values would most change the world if everyone lived them, um, it op seems to open up, the light seems to go on, and they realize what a difference values can make, especially when later on they think about people such as your grandmother. But what I love about the question, too, is their responses, because very often people have different responses. Some people say love and respect. Some people say peace and respect. Others say honesty and compassion. But every single answer is right. Even if we all just live two values, and really live them in every single action and word, the world would instantly change. We'd have peace overnight. <laughs> and then I knew this one thing. You're absolutely right. So to make it easy for my family, I listed down all the 12 values you talk about. And then I kind of made it a fun activity. I said, let's do voting. And everybody was supposed to choose top three values. and they did choose different values and we had good conversation after that. But unanimously, all the members, we are family of four, so they chose happiness. 
and the second value was different to each of them. Um, but I noticed these values are intertwined. They are related to each other. When my daughter said respect, um, then, you know, when we respect each other, definitely, you know, peace will happen in the family. So I'm wondering how, as a parent, I can inculcate these values in my heart and as well in my family. Do you have any guidance on that? Poonam, it sounds like you've already started. What I'm hearing is um, you have a natural inclination <laughs> towards love and peace and respect, and you're able to show that to your children. But I think, you know, everyone listening has also started. I feel that every person truly does want peace and they want well-being for themselves. And if they're in a family, they definitely want it for their children. So I think we start by first thinking about it and then maybe praying or meditating every morning and filling yourself with that energy of peace and that energy of love. And then to gradually watch and see what words you're using and what actions and just checking yourself. But you may want to go into some of the living values activities. For example, for adults, we have a special journal and exercises you can look up, or you can get the Living Values Education Activities books at Amazon or online free. And it's just lovely to play with the activities as you're doing with your family. And you're discussing them with your family, so they're starting to think about it. And even when you just talk about it in the way that you've talked about it with your family, you're opening up their mind to see, to watch, to observe, to notice in life. And when you watch a movie together, you can discuss it in terms of your values. People may want to choose their video games or the things that they do to enjoy certain ones. So there's so many hundreds of things you can do to grow your awareness of values. That's wonderful. I will certainly take all the ideas you shared with us. As far as I know, you do have a model also, um, which is mentioned in one of your book. Would you like to share more details about the model? I would love to. Great idea. Okay, the Living Values Education Theoretical Model is one of the major constructs for living values education. There's that and the living values developmental schematic. And these are the two major components of living values. The theoretical model is to create an atmosphere with certain behaviors. The schematic relates to the activities that parents and kids and educators can engage in. But the LVE theoretical model, there's a circle. And in the middle of the circle is a B for behavior. So plus or negative behavior. And at the top, in the top half of the circle are five words that go around making a semicircle. And they're loved, respected, valued, understood, and safe. And the whole theoretical basis of this model is that when we treat people, especially young people, in such a way that they feel loved, respected, valued, understood, and safe, they move towards their potential. So in workshops, what I do is I draw that model on the board and I put a slide up. And I ask people, what are the things that you do in your life or in your school or even you could do it in your organization that help create those feelings in others of feeling loved, respected, valued, understood, and safe? And so at the bottom half of the circle are five contrasting words, inadequate, 
hurt, afraid, shamed, unsafe. When we treat people in such a way that they feel inadequate, hurt, afraid, shamed, or unsafe, what happens inside? So in that bottom half of the circle and lower than that are minuses. And so in a workshop, I will also ask people, what are the negative things that happen in your organization, in your school, in your home, that help people feel these ways? So I actually have them fill that out. And very often, um, we'll do a reflective exercise on what they want and what they would like their ideal situation to be, be it at home or at school or in an organization. And people start describing what they want. For example, for people in a, in a family, it may be going out together in nature, you know, watching the birds and um, enjoying the trees and the flowers and hiking and um, maybe boating or swimming. <clears throat> and it may be family time or time with her friends, time with sports. Uh, in a school, it may be sports as well as good academics. Teachers may really notice and families may notice and organizations may notice that they feel better when their colleagues or their peers listen to them, appreciate them, say kind words, um, respect. People may notice that when there's conflict resolution or mediation, that things go better. So there's so many things. In living values, one of the main things I want parents or business people or teachers, educators, principals to get is that when we stay above the line, we create a culture that's nurturing, that's safe, perhaps, and you give people a choice. What ethos would you like? Do you want a culture of peace and respect or of caring and cooperation? Or what produces excellence? And you have them look at their culture, and then they can tailor make it to the things that they know that will work in their culture, in their situation. And it's a beautiful process. And then what we look at is what's below the line. What may happen in families, or in neighborhoods, or in businesses, or in schools that put young people or customers or colleagues, other teachers, what puts them on a downward spiral so that they go into feelings of that inadequacy and feel hurt? And children can actually feel very low and get very depressed and want to withdraw from school. Or some may become very angry with adults and want to take revenge or be violent. Um, so we look at the things that can happen. Maybe it's criticism. Maybe there's violence. Maybe there's bullying. Maybe there's snide comments or, you know, so many things that can happen. Because even if we are in a business or a school or in a family, <laughs> which we all are, certain things can hurt. First and foremost, we are human beings and we all thrive. We all glow when we're surrounded by appreciation and caring and fun and a safety. So one of the reasons why it's important to stay above the line is that you want people to feel safe, cared for, and valued. This is especially important in schools nowadays because a lot of children feel that it's not safe. A lot of young adults feel that there's bullying that goes on and other things. When young people are in an educational situation, 
and their classroom and their school is peaceful. When people value each other, when there's a family feeling of belonging, they actually can learn a lot better and develop terrific social and emotional skills. I love some of the stories from schools that have done this, and it's really lovely. But it also works in a family, in an organization, because that's what we love as human beings. So when I work with different organizations, usually schools, then we look at, okay, what are the factors below the line that we want to, that you want to get rid of? And they identify those factors. And then we take each one of those factors and look at a positive they can do instead. So in a school, it may be looking at a different kind of discipline. It may be, um, for example, in um, Living Values, we advocate a discipline based on peace and respect. And that model includes collaborative rulemaking and specific positive comments noticing, appreciation, acknowledging. A big component is active listening. And this is really important when people don't feel safe. So be it a child or a colleague, active listening when people are upset is incredible. I remember a little boy once and he was running away from his classroom towards the gate of the school, and his teacher was running after him. It was during class time. And she yelled at me, Diane, grab him, he's a runner. And somehow I was young enough to run across that courtyard and grab his hand, and he was so upset. And he was, he was only seven, fortunately, and he was pulling against me with all his might. And he was so upset. So I just bent down and I got at his eye level and I looked at him and I said, with love, you're really upset. And his arm went limp and his eyes just clung to mine. And he said, yes. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, somebody took my pencil. And I said, well, would you like to solve the problem? And he said, yes. I said, okay, let's go back to the classroom. And he said, okay. <laughs> so the act of listening was very short. But when people are upset, they own the problem. And that's the time to actively listen. And so we spend a lot of time in workshops on actively listening. And it's not just an automatic act of listening because what's important is actively listening with your heart. And um, so we do active listening. Um, we do conflict resolution, a win-win approach that's not blaming, not guilt-inducing, but that's empowering to all concerned. And then we look at... Um, Discipline with peace and respect. So we look at a four-step correction process um, that can help people look at values. We look at thinking time that's done to help people, young people, self-regulate. And then we combine that with all these activities that help them feel peaceful. And, you know, teach social skills. So it's a win-win. But so that's about the model. And it's a beautiful thing because you can really look at what's happening in your organization. And it's an opportunity to think about what do we really want in our organization, in our school, and in our family. Because we have the power to change it. Wow, I'm really intrigued with all the things you talked about. We are running out of time today, but I am so much looking forward to learn about all the things you mentioned, active listening, how to discipline with respect and peace. And even I was able to correlate why I was so connected with my grandmother because I did feel her love. I was feeling safe with her. I felt like I am being 
valued. I would like to talk about all the things you mentioned you do when you are conducting workshops. I'm sure my audience are also very excited to listen to all the things you have to share with us. Thank you so much for joining. Poonam, thank you so much. I enjoy learning and hearing about your experiences. And I am enjoying these interviews with you and I look forward to our next one. You have a wonderful week. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. You are listening to Mindful, Beautiful, and Thriving, a podcast series by Tharaka Foundation. As part of our youth series, we will be releasing new episodes every weekend, so make sure to continue to check those out. We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and thank you so much for listening.